Hi David, and indeed welcome back again. It's great to have another chance to talk with you. We're going to do something a little different this time, and rather than specifically discussing a current threat, we're going to look at the evolution of malware and how it's evolved to get us to the threat that we're currently having to deal with. Now you've been working in the antivirus industry for a while now, so I thought you'd be in a good position to reflect upon what's happened and what you've seen over the years. Hi Steve, nice to be here again. You're right, attention in any field of activity is often focused on immediate issues, but it can be useful to take a step back and look at the different factors that have led us to where we are now. Where would you like to start? OK, so we've been living with the malware problem now for many years, and to be honest, a great many listeners are probably of an age where they've never known things to be any different. But we know that once upon a time, there were days when systems didn't run the risk of malware infection. So how did it all begin? When did we see the first significant evidence of the virus threat, and how quickly did it grow? The first viruses appeared in the 1970s on dedicated networks like ARPANET, but it wasn't until computers became more widely accessible that malicious code started to appear in significant numbers. The first PC viruses arose out of experiments conducted by Fred Cohen at Lehigh University in 1984, he also created the standard industry-accepted definition of a computer virus, a program that copies itself. The first PC virus to be found in the field was Brain in 1986. These early days also saw the release of a number of network worms, including the Morris worm, although it was to be many years before worms were to become a serious real-world problem. Similarly, although there were a small number of Trojans, their impact on the threat landscape was negligible before the turn of the century. Just to clarify there, Cohen's work wasn't intentionally setting out to create a threat, was it? He'd identified what he believed to be an area of risk and was using his research to demonstrate that it could become a real concern. Then, as you say, things actually happened that started to prove him right a couple of years later. But it wasn't immediately the massive problem that we see today, was it? No, the early PC viruses were localised and slow spreading. When I entered the industry in June 1990, there were just 96 viruses. Ten years after the first PC viruses, there were still fewer than 10,000 viruses. Many viruses of this period, like Jerusalem and Cascade, infected programmes. But the major threat until 1995 came from boot sector viruses like Stoned, Michelangelo and Form. These viruses spread via the exchange of floppy disks. Techniques to hide infection, which we call stealth, and to make analysis and detection more difficult, what we call polymorphism, were developed during this early period. Floppy disks, eh? I remember them. They gave me my first encounter with a virus on a Commodore Amiga back in the late 80s. The Byte Bandit virus, it was called, and it arrived with some public domain software that I'd ordered, which came on a disk by mail. For those who've not heard of it, it was a destructive boot sector virus, and I can't say I was best pleased to have it. Back at the time, there was no antivirus package to handle the problem, so I remember having to do things to deal with it by hand. So in a roundabout way, that leads to another question. At what point in time did having antivirus protection become an essential for users? I'm not sure it's possible to isolate one moment where this happened. Rather, there were a series of tipping points in the threat landscape that brought antivirus further and further into the mainstream. As you mentioned, for the first few years after the appearance of brain virus, there were no antivirus products as such, just specific fixes created for each new virus as it appeared. Early virus analysts were typically drawn into it through research in a related field, for example data recovery. As you might imagine, antivirus became essential for anyone who'd experienced an infection of Stone, Jerusalem, Cascade or any other virus. In the beginning, there were those who dismissed the virus threat as an urban legend, but by 1988 this position was no longer tenable. The first antivirus products started to appear around 1988. Initially, they were bought by early adopters. But as some of the early viruses spread further, and the overall numbers began to climb, organisations began to understand the necessity of protecting their systems. The first time malware drew serious media attention was in March 1992, when there was a big focus on the 6th of March trigger date of the Michelangelo virus. 
Few machines went down as a result, actually, but the media attention further highlighted the potential danger of a virus infection. By the mid-1990s, the need for antivirus on PCs was becoming well established in business and was growing among consumers. At this point in time, though, I think it would be fair to say that malware was really more of a problem that users in general were likely to read about rather than to have experienced firsthand. The reliance on manual exchange of disks between machines tended to mean that even a prominent strain could take a while to spread, and so even though you were hearing a lot about the problem, it didn't necessarily feel like an ever-present threat in the way that it does today. But things, of course, are very different nowadays, so what do you feel prompted the change? Yes, you're right. To begin with, viruses spread very slowly, mainly via floppy disk, but sometimes also by being shared on BBSs, bulletin board systems. But in 1995, the threat landscape changed dramatically with the appearance of macro viruses. They were significant for two reasons. First, they infected data files, initially Word documents, but then other office files. In other words, the sort of files that people were most likely to exchange with each other. Second, the increasing use of email, especially as a business tool, provided a mechanism for viruses to spread further and faster than ever before. At first, macroviruses just benefited passively from email, but by the turn of the century, it had become common for virus writers to proactively use the email system in order to distribute their code. The era of the mass mailer started with the appearance of the macrovirus Melissa, Soon after that, macroviruses faded off the scene, but the hijacking of email in order to spread was adopted by email worms. In 2001, worms were to, so to speak, cut out the middleman altogether by spreading directly over the network, ushering in the use of system vulnerabilities in order to spread. By this time, that's round about 1999, not only was antivirus considered an essential element of corporate security, but businesses understood also the need to carry out anti-malware filtering at the web and mail gateways. Now we've seen an entire industry grow up around the term antivirus, but in reality the malware threat has taken a variety of forms, and indeed you've mentioned boot sector viruses, macro viruses, worms and trojans already in the discussion. What accounts for the prominence of different types of malware at different points in time? I think several factors have affected this. First, there's the technology we use. In the 1980s and 1990s, the primary means for transferring data was the floppy disk. So it's hardly surprising that the first PC viruses focused on infecting the disk itself. In other words, boot sector viruses that infected the disk regardless of what data was stored on it. There were file infectors, but they only represented about 20% of infections, mainly because people seldom transferred executable files. The broadening of internet access in the mid-1990s, and in particular the use of email as a key business tool, paved the way for macroviruses and also the gradual decline in boot sector viruses. It's also no accident that as the internet became further established, we saw the emergence of worms. Historically, they predated viruses, but until the mid-1990s, few people had internet access, so before then it wasn't a realistic method for mass infection. And finally, the development of the World Wide Web laid the foundations for the dominance of Trojan programs and, in particular, so-called drive-by downloads. In other words, the Internet allowed the spread of malware that was not self-replicating. Second, there's a socio-economic dimension to malware development. Technology does not develop in a vacuum, but it's conditioned by developments in society as a whole. Cybercrime, in other words malware designed to make money illegally, was possible only when online commerce developed, in fact only once it had reached critical mass. That's why malware before 2003 was almost exclusively cyber vandalism. Short of scrambling someone's data and making them send money to a P.O. box, and by the way this was unsuccessfully tried by the author of the AIDS information disc in 1989, it wasn't possible to make money from malware. Now, the overwhelming majority of malware programs are designed to make money. 
Our obvious dependence on the internet in every aspect of society has made possible the use of malware for other purposes. This includes not only political protest, but also attacks on critical infrastructure systems, as in the case of Stuxnet. It's good you mentioned the socio-economic aspect and the change in motivations there, because that links into the next theme I wanted to explore. It's clear that those producing malware have had different drivers over the years, and there's been a general transition from mischief towards money. Has this caused any change in what products have needed to do in response? Yes, it certainly has. Each generation of malware writers stands on the shoulders of those who preceded it, learning from what's been done before, reapplying what proved successful, but also trying to break new ground. In this way, successive waves of malware writers have redefined the threat landscape, and anti-malware vendors have had to adapt to existing technologies, developing new ones and creating new processes for analysing malware in order to meet each new challenge. As a result, both the disease and the cure have changed beyond all recognition. This isn't always apparent to the outside world. Many people still see it as a virus problem, matched by antivirus or AV solutions. This need to adjust anti-malware solutions to changing threats is as old as the malware problem itself. Let me give just a few examples. First, the emergence of polymorphic, that is, variably encrypted viruses in the early 1990s meant that simple signatures were no longer enough. So the industry started to implement statistical analysis methods and to develop emulation techniques to deal with complex malware. Second, the creation of macroviruses in 1995 meant that antivirus vendors had to develop techniques for scanning within data files. And third, the appearance in 2001 of the fileless worm Code Red made it essential to scan memory for malware. This had been commonplace in DOS scanners, but until Code Red appeared, it had not been necessary under Windows. But I would say the transition from cyber vandalism to cyber crime and the changes it's brought in its wake have had the biggest effect. In the good old days, malware was designed to disrupt a computer, for example rebooting the machine, encrypting data, deleting files, overwriting chunks of the hard disk, inadvertently overwriting key system sectors. The focus of cybercrime is stealing information that can be used to make money. So the last thing a cybercriminal wants to do is to disrupt the victim system. Their business depends on my computer running normally. At one level, our job remains the same, block malicious code. But the focus on maintaining the integrity of someone's data and securing their online identity has led to the inclusion of technologies that go beyond simply looking for malicious code. So today's comprehensive internet security suites include virtual keyboards, application sandboxing, whitelisting and more. Right, so there's clearly been a change in the anti-malware technology in response to the criminal motivations. Is that the only thing that's had an effect on how we need to go about things for detection and removal, or have other factors also had an effect? For example, what about the massive increase in the scale of the threat? Does this affect the viability of the tried and tested detection methods? Yes, absolutely. We've seen an explosion in the number of malicious programs in recent years. Just five years ago, our virus lab received around 200 new samples a day. Today, our analysts receive 125,000 unique malware samples every day. And there are tens of millions of samples in our collection overall. One of the reasons for this is the decreased shelf life of malware. In the 1990s, viruses were comparatively slow to spread, but once they reached critical mass, they might circulate for many years. Today, an individual variant might last no more than a week. So many of the samples we see are variants of existing malware families, churned out by cybercriminals to refresh earlier versions. Clearly, there's no way we could keep up with this sort of factory production of malware using signatures alone. Nor could we do so by manually analysing each and every sample we receive. Signatures were never the only mechanism used to detect malware. I've already mentioned the development of emulation techniques to deal with polymorphic viruses. 
but heuristic analysis, in other words, identifying harmful code rather than looking for sequences of bytes belonging to known viruses, and also generic signatures, in other words, detecting whole families of malware, date back to the 1990s. But the upsurge in numbers in the mid-2000s gave a massive impetus to the development of proactive detection technologies, including behavioral analysis, assessing the overall reputation of files, and the real-time use of cloud-based infrastructures. If you look at any of our quarterly malware reports on SecureList.com, you'll find a big chunk of detections that are generic rather than specific signature-based detections. On top of this, today's advanced internet security products employ a wide range of other technologies designed to secure people's online activities. They can alert you to vulnerabilities that exist in any applications you use. They can secure your online transactions. They can block spam. They can secure children's online activities, not only blocking undesirable content, but also preventing children from posting sensitive information online. They can encrypt your data. They can even create complex passwords for each of your online accounts, storing them securely and entering them automatically when you log in. And they can also secure banking transactions from cyber criminal activities like key logging. Also, as I mentioned earlier, it wouldn't be possible to manually analyze each and every one of the 125,000 samples we receive daily. Fortunately, we don't have to. Our use of proactive measures for blocking malware also extends to analysis of malware in the lab. The vast majority of samples are analyzed automatically using technologies and processes that have been developed and fine-tuned over many years of malware analysis. I think all of this goes to show that although we still see it a lot, the term antivirus itself is probably a bit dated nowadays because, as you say, the products themselves need to do a fair bit more in order to provide comprehensive protection online. Even if you can still get a standalone product that does just antivirus, I don't think it would be advisable to choose it over something more inclusive. That's actually what surprises me when talking to Mac users a lot of the time. Even though the platform is still relatively safe when it comes to malware, they still ought to want protection from the other internet threats that can affect them regardless of the operating system that they're running. Now with products in mind, I mentioned earlier that a whole industry has emerged around these threats, with Kaspersky Lab clearly being one of the key players. But to be honest, everyone seems to have similar looking or similar sounding products on offer. So what would you say really differentiates the AV vendors? What are the practical reasons for choosing one over another? And given that several of the solutions are free, and I'm a stingy academic, why do I want to go and pay for something anyway? The bottom line is, how well does a vendor protect its customers from malware? Given the volume and complexity of malicious code today, this comes down to how effective a vendor's proactive solutions are, and how well integrated they are. As I've already said, this goes way beyond the realms of traditional antivirus, in other words, signature-based scanning. Of course, the product itself is just the visible tip of the iceberg. Beneath the surface is the investment a company is making in its analysis, research and development teams. Another key differentiator, I believe, is the support infrastructure provided by a vendor. We'd all rather not be infected by malware. But if it happens, having a helping hand to resolve the problem, just a phone call away, is invaluable. As you'd imagine, there's a very broad spectrum of knowledge among our customers. On the one hand, we have skilled IT professionals. On the other, we have people who don't know much about what goes on under the surface, behind the desktop they can see in front of them. What they have in common, however, is that they don't have our expertise. And being able to phone a friend, so to speak, reduces the pain caused by malware. One way to get a feel for a company's research expertise is to look at what the company is talking about, what white papers it's publishing, what it's talking about in analytical articles, what it's saying in blog posts, and so on. In itself, however, this doesn't answer the direct question which product will best protect you from malware. This can be a tricky question to answer. If you're looking to buy a car, you can take it out for a test drive and see how it performs, but you can't do this with anti-malware products. You can download a trial version, of course, but you don't have the means to test its ability to block malware. 
OK, so how about the opportunity to let other people do the testing for you? Are there relevant objective tests that can be performed and reported? Historically, the best independent tests have provided not only a non-partisan evaluation of anti-malware solutions, but also the expertise to provide an informed view of their effectiveness. However, not all tests focus on detection, and even when they do, it's very difficult to match the real-life conditions under which malware is likely to spread, and therefore which solutions do the job best. In the 1990s, the focus of tests was on building a library of in-the-wild samples and seeing which products could detect them. At the turn of the century, the focus shifted to measuring how quickly vendors updated their products to keep pace with new threats. Currently, independent testers are slowly evolving to reflect the fact that the best anti-malware solutions use a range of technologies over and above signatures, including the use of real-time cloud-based infrastructures. This makes testing very difficult, but it's essential if tests are to be meaningful. If anyone's interested in learning more about what makes a good test, it's worth reading Eugene Kaspersky's blog post on the subject. It's an October 2011 post called The Holy Grail of AV Testing and Why It Will Never Be Found. And you can find uh, this blog post and others by Eugene at eugene.kaspersky.com. No test is perfect, so the best way to get a feel for what is a good product is to look at a company's track record in a range of tests. Two of the best known testing organizations are AV Test. They can be found at av-test.org and also AV Comparatives. They can be found at av-comparatives.org. Well, I guess that even if these can't provide a definitive answer, they give people somewhere to check against in addition to the claims that vendors might otherwise be making on the websites and in their other marketing. Let's go back to considering some of the evolution aspects. We've heard about the techniques and the technologies, but let's think about the impacts of the incidents themselves. What have been the worst incidents over the years, in your opinion? I think it depends on how you define worst. There are different criteria you can use. You can focus on the historical significance of a threat. You can focus on how widespread it became. Or you can focus on its impact. Let me give you an example of each. The first is brain virus, which appeared in 1986. Not only was it the first PC virus, but it used a technique known as BIOS sector read redirection in order to conceal its presence on infected disks. It's what we'd now call a rootkit. By targeting floppy disks, Brain laid the groundwork for an infection method that was to dominate the threat landscape until the mid-1990s. The second is Melissa, which appeared in March 1999. On the face of it, this seemed to be just another macro virus with yet another trivial message. However, by hijacking the email system in order to spread proactively, it spread further and faster than any virus before it, overwhelming corporate email servers with the sheer volume of messages it sent and received. Melissa was one of the final macro viruses, but at the same time it ushered in the era of the worm. The third is Stuxnet first analysed in June 2010. Now this was notable for several reasons. The level of sophistication behind Stuxnet was beyond anything we'd previously seen. The worm made use of five vulnerabilities, including four zero-day vulnerabilities, plus a further vulnerability in Siemens WinCC software relating to default access passwords. Stuxnet includes a rootkit that is signed using legitimate digital certificates stolen from Realtek Semiconductors and J-Micron. The purpose of Stuxnet also marks it out from the malware we'd seen before. In contrast to the cybercrime programs designed to steal confidential data, Stuxnet was designed to sabotage specific industrial processes. Its primary purpose was to interfere with the logic of controllers used by frequency converters. These controllers are used to adjust the rotation frequency of very high speed motors that have a very limited range of applications. One example is to drive centrifuges. Yes, the Stuxnet case has prompted a lot of subsequent discussion and I remember the coverage of Melissa too that rightly highlighted it as a game changer. 
Thinking about these developments then, to what extent have attackers managed to stay ahead of the AV technologies that are seeking to thwart them? In one sense, I'd have to say that they have managed to stay ahead. After all, the malware problem hasn't gone away. Actually, it's become much worse, both in terms of numbers and the effects on victims. On the other hand, this is only because cybercriminals have constantly been forced to develop new technologies, new approaches and new threats. In other words, because anti-malware solutions have been able to find ways to neutralize successive waves of malware. In the early days, antivirus solutions that were used were largely reactive. In other words, a new threat appeared, antivirus companies received a sample and analyzed it, a signature was added to the product, and the next version would detect the threat. Some companies also provided inline update mechanisms to add detection for a new threat between product updates. In fairness, some products also provided other protection technologies. For example, the ability to check some clean files and then detect changes to the files. However, these could generate false alarms if a program was updated, and in any case, most people preferred specific detections for known viruses. It's a very clear-cut thing. You either have a virus or you don't. The addition of heuristic and generic detection to antivirus products in the 1990s meant that they acquired some proactive capabilities. In other words, the ability to detect new threats, even if they hadn't been seen and analysed before. But even these technologies had to be tweaked from time to time to take account of new types of threat. The growth of highly targeted attacks in recent years places a greater importance than ever before on the ability to detect new malware without the need for a signature. If there's only one victim, it may mean that anti-malware companies never get to see the code. If you take, for example, Stuxnet, it was many months after its first appearance, before security researchers got their hands on that code. If all they have in their arsenal is reactive, signature-based technologies, they can offer little or no protection to a victim of a targeted attack. Fortunately, the comprehensive array of technologies used in the best of today's internet security solutions does provide a highly effective barrier to the spread of malware. Even so, it's important to recognize that security is a process, not a set of technologies, however good they are. Notwithstanding the sophistication of today's threats, there remains the human factor in security. The starting point for many attacks today is to trick someone into doing something that compromises their security or their employer's security. At a societal level, responsibility for dealing with cybercrime is shared. First, there must be a legal framework for dealing with cyber attacks, legislation, law enforcement agencies. Second, technology is needed that is able to block attacks, and that's where, our, where we come in, that's our primary goal. Third, people need to understand the threat and what they can do to reduce the risk. This applies both to employees and individuals at home. Right then, let's finish with an easy question, one which I'm sure you'll be able to answer with absolute confidence. What's in store for the future? Well, we don't have a crystal ball, but given that the future always develops from what's here today, we can offer some informed guesses as to what's in store for us. For now, the threat landscape continues to be dominated by random, indiscriminate attacks designed to capture personal data, in particular financial data, from anyone unlucky enough to fall victim to malicious code or the tricks of the cyber criminals. However, the number of targeted attacks has been growing steadily. Such attacks, far from being random, are focused on specific organizations. Some have involved very well-known organizations such as RSA, Sony and others. But cybercriminals don't confine their attacks to large organizations. Any organization can be a potential target. Targeted attacks are typically highly sophisticated hiding their activities using advanced rootkits, code obfuscation techniques, and encryption. But as I've said, often the starting point for attacks like this is to trick people into doing something that they shouldn't have done, like disclosing snippets of information that the cybercriminals can then aggregate and use that to profile a company and then launch an attack. 
The mobile malware threat is also gaining momentum. 2011 was a pivotal year in the development of mobile malware. We saw the same volume of threats in that year as we saw in the whole period from 2004 to 2010. Currently, there are more than 30,000 mobile malware threats. That's at a rate of about 5 per hour. The fastest growing area of development is malware aimed at Android. That's because it's popular, it's easy to create software for it, and there's also a ready-made distribution mechanism in the form of Google Play, what used to be the Android marketplace. Almost 89% of threats target the Android operating system. The increasing use of smartphones, the mix of personal and business data on mobile devices, and the trend in business towards bring your own device to work, makes them an increasingly attractive target for cyber criminals. And to be honest, the more personal data that is stored on a mobile device, and the more we use them to log into online services, the more they will be targeted in the future. Mac threats are also growing. When contrasted with the torrent of malware targeting Windows, the number of Mac threats is actually small. However, it has been growing steadily. And it would be naive for anyone using a Mac to imagine that they're immune from attack in some way. Until 2011, Mac malware is confined largely to Trojan DNS changes or fake antivirus programs. But as I say, this is changing fast. There are more than 100 million Mac OS X users around the world and this is likely to continue to grow. The emergence of the flash fake Trojan has shown very clearly that cyber criminals now believe, it's, believe that it's worth their while to develop malware targeting Macs. The first versions of this Trojan appeared in September 2011, but they didn't become widespread until March 2012. Kaspersky Lab's data show that by April 2012, almost 700,000 Macs had been infected by flash fake. And in July, we saw a new backdoor for Mac called Morecut. So it's essential that anyone, individual or company, using Macs should secure them in the same way that they would secure their Windows-based computers. Over the last year or so, cyber criminals have made use of stolen digital certificates to sign their malware, giving their programs a stamp of authenticity. This is really what's been behind attacks on the affiliate of Komodo, and more recently the Diginotar attack. It's likely that this sort of activity will increase in the future as cyber criminals try to sneak in under the radar, so to speak. It's clear that the increasing storage of data in the cloud and the use of other cloud-based services will add a new dimension to the threat landscape, specifically attacks on the cloud itself. This is, of course, related to the rise of targeted attacks. The difference being that the aggregation of data in a single place offers a, a so to speak, one-stop shop for cyber criminals. We've already seen developments in this area. For example, the use of Amazon's cloud infrastructure to spread malware, and also the attack on the Sony PlayStation Network in 2011. I've given a brief outline of some of the key trends here, but if anyone's interested in reading more, I'd recommend some of the security bulletins that we publish from time to time on securelist.com. In particular, my colleagues Kostin Ryu and Alexander Gostev produced a report specifically on malware evolution in 2011 and some sort of forecasts for the future as well. Oh, how disappointing, David. I was rather hoping you'd say that the future was all sorted out and the attackers would probably give up pretty soon. I guess I'd better renew my AV subscription after all, then. In all seriousness, though, I think you're right. Um, from everything we've talked about earlier in the session, the one thing that's clear is that the problem doesn't stand still. If I had to bet, I'd say that the mobile context is one in which we're going to get hit harder than we should, simply because people haven't cottoned on to the threat that's emerging and taken the possible steps to protect their devices. And unfortunately, I wouldn't dismiss any of your other predictions either. We'll have to get together again in a few years' time and do another retrospective in order to see what actually happened. For now, though, thanks very much indeed, David, for having made the time to talk to us again. My pleasure as always, Steve.